Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for gathering here this evening. Let me start by paying my respects to Anil Darkar, a man I never met. But in life, the greatest mark we leave is in our students, in our juniors, in our children, and in the institutions we create. And in that sense, I'm privileged to come and, and deliver this address in memory of a man who was clearly a creative force, a polymath, a mentor to many, and a true patriot. Let me also thank the NCPA and Godridge for their sponsorship. Such discussions are increasingly rare in our country, but very important. I thank Amy Fernandez and the organizing committee for inviting me months ago when I was still relatively unknown, as opposed to the last week or so. <clears throat> I'm very happy to be in Mumbai after almost a decade. I once lived here for a few years, but I haven't been back uh, in several. And every time I come, I realize it's a unique city like no other in the world with its own energy and recharges me. I also thank Anuradha Sengupta for being the interlocutor for this evening. I look forward to the conversation, and I thank the MC for the very kind introduction. 75 years, 10 days, and about 18 hours ago, the architect of modern India, Pandit Nehru, delivered his seminal speech entitled, A Tryst with Destiny. I'd like to start by quoting the opening statement of his speech. Long years ago, we made a tryst with destiny. And now the time comes when we shall redeem our pledge, not wholly or in full measure, but very substantially. At the stroke of the midnight hour when the world sleeps, India will awake to life and freedom. A moment comes which but rarely in history, when we step out from the old to the new, when an age ends and when the soul of a nation long suppressed finds utterance. It is fitting at this solemn moment we take the pledge of dedication to the service of India and her people and to the still larger cause of humanity. At the dawn of history, India started on her unending quest and trackless centuries are filled with her striving and grandeur of her success and failures. Through good and ill fortune alike, she has never lost sight of that quest, forgotten the ideals which gave her strength. Every word in that statement has so much meaning. Every line was crafted with the decades of struggle that went into what became the freedom movement and the expected burden of creating a republic, a constitution, a country where there had been none before. Though Pandit Nehru talks about India's quest, the notion of India as a nation is itself an aberration in the history of our culture. For thousands of years, in different parts of our country, different cultures flourished, different languages, different ways of life, different religions, different models of governance. Out of this was crafted a country. It was an improbable outcome, as many have said. In an earlier address, I called it a miracle. When all around us, People with the same language, with the same religion, with the same culture, with the same history are dividing themselves into smaller and smaller units. Here we have a country that has quadrupled in population, whose economy has grown tremendously, whose diversity has become increasingly extreme, and yet we have lasted as a nation without any serious threat unlike our neighbors in Southeast Asia. You look at the Middle East, where they have at least a main common religion and a common language, and yet it consists of so many different states. But in India, we have states that were divided by language at inception, and yet we continue as one country. This is truly a miracle. It is a miracle in its conception, and it is a greater miracle in its continuance. And yet today, we find ourselves with a lot of pause when we think about our future. Our institutions, which were once 
fated for their independence, have started to crumble and become pliant. Individual freedoms, the freedom of speech, of practice, of religion, of habits, have started to come under stress from unruly mobs and rabble-rousers. A cult-like fervor seems to have gripped our country, where reason doesn't penetrate, and you have this kind of mob mentality that takes over all debates. Our economy is far below its potential. The growth rate has not seen anywhere near the best we have seen in the last seven, eight years. In fact, it wasn't me alone. About three o'clock this morning when I was finishing up my speech, I happened to see a note about an op-ed that had come out in the New York Times by somebody very brilliant, I think, because I'm going to read uh, an excerpt from it. And he says, despite widespread poverty, illiteracy, and extreme ethnic, religious, and social diversity, India has blazed a trail since independence as what has been called an improbable democracy. It adopted a progressive constitution, but also retained highly centralized British colonial administrative structures that give elected state and national executives nearly unfettered control over institutions such as the police and other law enforcement agencies. Combined with draconian security and sedition laws, this allows elected state and national leaders to curb dissent with impunity. Mr. Modi's party has turbocharged these tools of repression, but it is hardly the first to weaponize them. I argue that all of these symptoms that we see are at the root driven by a fundamental problem mentioned in passing by Mr. Godrej earlier. And that is we have uncontrolled and rising inequality in our country. That is the biggest threat our democracy faces today. If you have people without hope, it is easy to play on their fears. If you have people who have not seen development, it's easy to convince them that life is a zero-sum game. You see, the whole notion of democracy as a model of governance is supposed to be that it is the antithesis of what Marx predicted. Marx predicted that in any society that did not have common ownership of property, eventually the returns to capital would become so high and the returns to labor would become so low that the masses would no longer be willing to participate in a system that made them effectively work for other people. And then you would see the workers of the world unite and you would see blood on the streets. The antidote to that was supposed to be democracy. It was supposed to be that once you gave every person a vote, once people needed to be elected to run government, that the vested interests of those who control the money or control the industry would be surpassed, would be overtaken by the need for the greater good. That is the actual secret sauce of democracy. But have we seen that? At least in India, we have seen very little of that. Let me frame it a different way as a finance minister. In a democracy, there are only three or four really core components to a government's responsibilities economically, financially. The first is to raise revenues adequately and fairly and efficiently with minimal leakage. The second is to use them to provide high quality public goods and services and pathways for social progress and social mobility, education, access to training, access to jobs. The third is to provide an environment that supports private entrepreneurship and growth. And finally, to provide a safety net for those who need the help of somebody at any time. It will not be always the same people at all times. In this, there is a hidden statement, which is that there is a huge redistributive component to the responsibility of a government. It is our job to find the places where we can raise the money and to put it to those people who need it to get ahead. In fact, let me quote again from the seminal speech of Pandit Nehru. He saw this back in 1947. He says, and so we have to labor and to work and to work hard to give reality to our dreams. 
Those dreams are for India, but they are also for the world, for all the nations and peoples are too closely knit together today. 1947, imagine the extent of globalization today. For any one of them to imagine that it can live apart. Peace is said to be indivisible. So is freedom. So is prosperity now. And also is disaster in this one world that can no longer be split into isolated fragments. This notion that equality in outcomes is the basis for a democracy is actually enshrined in our constitution. If you look at the discussions that happened for the Constituent Assembly and the articles that came out of it, I'll just cite two of those. Article 38 in the Constitution of India. The state shall strive to promote the welfare of the people by securing and protecting as effectively as it may a social order in which justice, social, economic, and political shall inform all the institutions of the national life. The state shall, in particular, strive to minimize the inequalities in income and endeavor to eliminate inequalities in status, what we call social justice, facilities and opportunities, not only amongst individuals, but also amongst groups of people residing in different areas, state to state, or engaged in different vocations. Article 39 of the Constitution of India. Certain principles of policy to be followed by the state. The state shall, in particular, direct its policy towards securing A, that the citizens, men and women equally, have the right to an adequate means of livelihood. B, that the ownership and control of the material resources of the community are so distributed as best to subserve the common good. C, that the operation of the economic system does not result in the concentration of wealth and means of production to the common detriment. D, that there is equal pay for equal work for both men and women. F, that children are given opportunities and facilities to develop in a healthy manner and in conditions of freedom and dignity. If this is the basis of our constitution, then we are actually failing quite badly at it. I quote again from this morning's op-ed. Though India's descent towards tyranny has accelerated under Mr. Modi, it would be unfair to put all the blame on him. Weak government institutions and social inequality, problems that have festered since India's early years, have sapped its democracy and provided fertile ground for the politics of Hindu supremacy to take root. Let me give you some statistics. These are probably two or three years old. In the state of Bihar, the average citizen is a 19-year-old male. He is an elementary school dropout. His income is about 80,000 rupees a year. And the average female has a total fertility rate in her lifetime of about 3.5 births. In Tamil Nadu, the average citizen is a 31-year-old female. is a high school graduate, has income of about 3 lakh rupees a year, and has total fertility rate of about 1.6 children. This is as extreme as it can get. If I track it from the 1950s till today, data doesn't exist before 51 till the states were separated. This gap has kept on getting higher and higher and higher. If I take uh, any measure, infant mortality, let's say, the infant mortality rate of India is probably around 35 to 40. In Kerala, it is 6. In Tamil Nadu, it is 20. In Bihar, it is 48. In Uttar Pradesh, it is 64. In Gujarat, which has a higher per capita income than Tamil Nadu, it is 34. We are not in any means equal. We have not been in a long time. And we have continued to get more and more unequal with every passing year. We have a couple of unique issues in India. If you look at any other federal setup where movement of labor is considered free, I don't need a visa, I don't need to uh, get any permission, I can go and settle wherever I want, you will find a natural concentration of the population where there is the greatest economic activity. That's true in America. That's true in China. It's not true in India. In India, you have the greatest economic activity in states that are becoming increasingly smaller part of India's population, and the lowest economic activity, at least per capita, 
in those states that have the highest and increasing populations. Even within a state, you look at the difference between rural and urban. Let me take my own state. In my own state, there's a difference in the total fertility rate between urban and rural Tamil Nadu. This is after the fact that Tamil Nadu is the most urbanized state in the country with roughly 50% of people living in urban areas. Access to things like entertainment, cell phones, are not that disparate. Even internet access these days, because you can get it over satellites and you can have cell towers. But access to schools, to drinking water systems, to underground drainage, not so much. So we have a society that is coming apart. And in this difference, there is a lot of room for the kind of politics of zero sum and othering and fear mongering. I could look at any number of statistics. If I compare infant mortality versus per capita income, it's very clear those places that have high per capita income have low infant mortality. If I look at access to education for women, it's very clear, except for exceptions like Gujarat, there's much higher access to education in places that have high um, economic activity and vice versa. I've already spoken a lot about this and uh, quoted these statistics in many places, so I don't want to um, keep on talking about statistics, but these are very obvious in any assessment, in Niti Aayog, in the RBI, in any number of studies. And so I quote again from this morning's op-ed, but a deeper and much older hindrance to the development of a healthy, resilient democracy has been India's historical failure to ensure the welfare of its poorest citizens. Hundreds of thousands of children die each year from hunger, and more than a third are stunted, even as Indian billionaires raise up the global wealth charts. So that's the problem we face today. I've talked about it in many places. I'm not the first, I won't be the last. But let me talk a bit about how I see the way forward. What are the ways we can remove this? What are the ways we can get over this? I'm going to propose in the limited time I have 10 ideas or 10 areas where I think we can make huge progress if we apply ourselves the right way. First, we must go back to the constitutional principle that our job as governments, as society, is to ensure justice, social, economic, and political. That cannot just be words. It has to be put into action. If we put into action, we must ask the Finance Commission, no longer will you allocate money just because people are poor. Because after 50 years of giving money to poorer people, the poor are getting poorer and poorer, and the rich are getting richer and richer. Something is structurally wrong. We have to allocate based on the right incentives. We have to tax based on fairness. The ratio of direct to indirect taxes in most OECD countries, the target is 60% direct taxes because it's progressive, it's targeted. In our country, we don't come close. We have skewed payouts. Those that are able to capture the system can get huge payouts even as a class. Those who do not have access don't see such upside. I'll go into detail in a minute. Corruption is a clear way of destroying economic equality or justice. Those who are able to pay X get 3X or 5X out of the state. So these are the root causes of inequality or the barriers to achieving justice, social, economic, and political. There are practical steps we can take the courage to act and to frame laws and to execute them based on the words that come out of our mouth or reside in the Constitution. Second, we must incentivize states for the empowerment of women and investment in children. I said this to the 15th Finance Commission and Mr. N.K. Singh. I said, of all the variables you use to incentivize states, nowhere does it say what percentage of girls are in school. Nowhere does it say, do women have equal access to property rights? Why is that important? Because there is no future without children, and there are no children without women. Statistic after statistic shows us, if you focus on the right things, for example, the correlation between access to menstrual hygiene and women staying in school is huge. The more you give them access, 
the more likely they are to stay in school. The correlation for, let's say, more than 10 years of school to menstrual access, hygiene access, is very, very high. You can see the chart here. If they stay in school, they delay marriage. If they delay marriage, you have lower infant mortalities, maternal mortalities. They have healthier babies. You get a lower total fertility rate, and you get a virtuous cycle. If you ask me, the single thing that makes Tamil Nadu stand where it does today is that in 1921, the Justice Party government legislated the right for women to vote and compulsory elementary education for boys and girls. From that day, we have focused on empowering women, and that has brought us to where we are today, 100 years plus later. The third thing we must do is be a much more tolerant and harmonious society. Anybody who's been in financial markets knows that investors prize stability, predictability. There is no prosperity without peace. There is no justice without universal inclusion. If you have a system that can turn on the whims and fancies of whoever is in power that day, that is not the environment, the milieu into which anybody is willing to put capital. Even our Political opponent in Tamil Nadu, Ms. Jayalalitha, her slogan was Amaidi Valam Valarchi. First start with peace, calm, harmony. Then you do look at good agriculture, good farming, and then good growth and good prosperity. An essential component of a tolerant and harmonious society will be number four, full freedom of speech and expression. There is no all-knowing, all-seeing person. It is heresy for religious people, and it is plain unscientific for rational people that any one human being can be that brilliant, can be that perceptive, can be that well-read, can be that knowledgeable in everything. That's what cults are for. That's not what normal people in a democracy should talk about. The more open dialogue we have, the better our decisions the better the perception of buy-in from all those who have been engaged in the dialogue, the healthier our democracy, and the better our perception of freedom that our forefathers sought for us to get. Of course, the media has a big role to play, and every day we see the media becoming more and more beholden to other interests. But I don't worry too much about that. The role of the media overall is declining very rapidly with the universality of internet access. In a place like Tamil Nadu, no media controls the narrative. Social media controls the narrative. The penetration of internet is about 80% in the population. Everybody is on 50 WhatsApp groups. You cannot even spread the fake news very long because it gets called out by 10 other guys who can say the truth. The fifth, we must strengthen our institutions. There has been a long debate that the observed correlation between the strength of institutions and the economic progress of a nation or a state, which is the chicken and which is the egg? Is it that economic progress drives citizens to demand better institutions, or is it that better institutions create better economic outcomes? I think the debate is settled once and for all because we have seen the reverse. We have seen the decline of institutions in developed economies, and we have seen the consequent downfall of economic activity. So it's very clear now that you need good institutions, independent institutions, checks and balances, and that's how you get a harmonious society, and that's how you get a good economic outcome. In fact, part of our problem, why we are seeing this huge global kind of deterioration of democracy, it's not only in India, we've seen the far right rise in many parts of the world, is that globalization and globalization, let's all be very clear, this is not the first age of globalization. This may be the third or the fourth or the fifth. There have been times when the world has been much more integrated economically than it is today. This is unique because of the speed of transport, the movement of population, the connectivity of internet, the remote delivery of services. There are some unique features to this globalization. But purely from an economic activity perspective, we are just another wave in the cyclicality of globalization. Globalization always increases the pie, always, always, always. Mathematically, it's provable. What it doesn't do is ensure that that pie is equally divided. In fact, unless there are continuous efforts to break the model or the pattern, 
every time the pie increases rapidly, it will increase inequality. It will end up in too few hands, too much money. And that leads to the kind of disgruntlement across societies that we have seen in the US, in Europe, in the UK, in other parts of the world. And we have seen that that disgruntlement leads to a discrediting of the institutions and the discrediting of the institution leads to all kinds of economic problems. So we are observing vicious cycles in many places. We need to turn that around into a virtuous cycle and ensure that our, it's, our, our uh, institutions become independent and well governed. At the risk of stoking some old wounds in Delhi, the sixth point I want to make is that we need a massive improvement in the judiciary. We need to change the ratio of funding that we give to the judicial system. We need to reduce the time and the complexity of getting a decision. As a participant in global debt markets, I can assure you that the single biggest barrier to India's growth from a financial perspective is the lack of an efficient debt market. The reason we have no such market is because all debt markets require uh, underpinning. They require a timely, predictable, based on precedent debt resolution system that allows people to know what the risk is if the return doesn't happen. We don't have that. You go to court, it could take you 20 years. We don't have a developed debt market because we don't have a reasonable, predictive judicial and dispute resolution system. We have more problems than that. The independence of the judiciary is under serious threat. The huge delay, we have all heard of the notion that justice delayed is justice denied. I will quote Mr. Arun Jaitley, the former finance minister of India and the former Rajya Sabha MP when he said that he wonders if post-retirement appointments are influencing pre-retirement judgments. All of these need to be considered and fixed. In fact, Article 37 of the Constitution states that the provisions contained in this part, that is part four on the government, shall not be enforceable by any court, but the principles laid down are nevertheless fundamental in the governance of the country and it shall be the duty of the state to apply these principles in making laws. So when I say that the court does not have any place in certain debates, I'm only quoting the Constitution. I'm not denigrating anybody. Number seven, we need a significant devolution of power. We are the most centralized, least effective form of government anywhere in the world today. You take large countries from communist China to capitalist America, the devolution of powers to the states, to the counties, to the towns, to the villages, from school boards to police forces are run by local bodies. Taxes are set by counties and states. Licenses are issued for industrial permits by cities in China. We have everything set up in one place. Not just one place, one place that includes states that were created because they had different languages and different cultures and different history, and that have now become so far apart in any measure in outcomes from education to per capita income to access to health, that it makes no sense. You see, the luxury of devolving power, the luxury of putting power close to the people, is that it greatly increases the chance of success. Let me just give you two ways of looking at it. The union government had these flagship schemes, Swachh Bharat, Krishi Kalyan. If you look at any CAG report, you'll find so many instances where they say the buildings were built for the toilets, but no water supply was provided by the municipality because that was not funded on an ongoing basis by the union government. There are schools in Bihar where money was given for whitewashing, but they only had thatched schools. They couldn't whitewash the thatch. You see, you cannot have a one-size-fits-all coming from any place, least of all Delhi. But if you give it to the local bodies, they can customize the program to their needs. They will be more responsive, the local representatives, to the local voters. And most of all, they will be accountable. What we really need the union to look after is things like the stability of the currency, international relations, defense, international trade, and so forth. 
And what we need the panchayats upwards to look at is solving people's daily problems. Let me give you an example of what we've done in Tamil Nadu just now. Because of the stunting data that we've seen, particularly post demonetization, my chief minister has announced that we're going to run on a pilot project, a breakfast program at schools. Now, we could have gone multiple ways in this. We already have a noon meal scheme program where we have uh, every government school, all children are supplied lunch at school. But we have huge limitations in that. If we spend one rupee on providing this lunch, more than 70 paisa goes to labor, only 30 goes to uh, procurement and, and, and cooking. So what we have done is we have come up with a pilot approach now. We say, we give this money as a block grant to a panchayat. That panchayat must create a self-help group of the mothers of the children who attend that school. Those people will be given the money to buy supplies, to cook it, to deliver it to their own children with the government support. Some genius then came and told me, the problem with this is there will be corruption. So I asked the question, is there likely to be corruption in the purchase of food when the mothers are buying it for their children, village by village, or is there likely to be corruption if we try to do a statewide tender for 2,000 crores? It makes no sense to me that there would be more corruption when a mother buys for her son or daughter. So we can change this construct by making it more devolved. And we need to do that all the way from the union down to the panchayat. We need to do data collection and data-based decision making. Of late, we have seen that whenever the numbers don't suit the political narrative, we just stop measuring. This is the worst possible strategy to take. When you have data, you really understand what is happening and you can be thoughtful about your plan. In Tamil Nadu, the first thing we came in, I said one of the five pillars of our administration in my initial budget will be a data-centric approach. We started collecting information, we started cross-referencing data. The state already has so much data. And in many programs, in loan waivers and some other things that had been promised in the manifesto, we were able to cut 75%, thousands and thousands of crores from the bill because we were able to cross-reference the data and identify fraud and uh, ineligible people. Thousands of crores. Sometimes we collect data. This union government is voracious in collecting data, but the data is of no use to anybody. For example, during COVID, every single COVID vaccine data was a data point was collected by the union. But when we as a state went to try and do a survey, where is the penetration and where should we focus more, we found that we don't have access to the data, only the union has access to the data. They didn't give us access to the database. So in frustration, we had to start a parallel database where we're running the data entry twice, once through us and once to them, so that we can analyze which block, which street, which house, what is the penetration of vaccination. Income tax data, which can tell us who is eligible, not eligible. States don't have access. GST data, I'm a member of the GST council. Till recently, we were not given access to the data. Only in the last GST council, at my request and the support of all other state ministers, we have said that every state's data can be shared to every other state because otherwise there's arbitrage. We don't know what the same entity is doing in UP or in Haryana. Now we have agreed, the GST council collectively, that all data will be shared to all people. So we, we must collect more, we must make it more accessible and applicable in decision making. All of this will help us reduce inequality. The ninth point, we must align incentives and create better org structures for our government employees. We have a profound problem. At least in Tamil Nadu, I won't comment on other states. We have a decay in the culture of our government employees. There's zero accountability. There's no alignment of incentives. Suspensions or transfers are the ultimate stick. They don't really have much value. We have very little by way of carrot. Almost every department in the government of Tamil Nadu, as a Minister for Human Resources, I say our vacancy rate is north of 30%. Many people want this to continue because you see, if somebody has two or three jobs, then they're not accountable for anything. When you ask them about A, they say I was doing B. You ask them about B, they say I was doing C. If we tried to go and fill these 30% of the jobs, we couldn't afford it because the pay scales inside government service are 2x, 3x the market wages. Then the pension costs come in. So we need some profound change there. 
in tamil nadu we are doing three things one we are trying our best to substitute technology and automated systems as far as possible and all government service it is my stated intent in the assembly will go one of two ways for the majority i want it done online remove all rent seeking remove all need for travel remove all barriers to access and for those that cannot we will deliver the service to their house surely there will be those who are too old who don't have access to technology who don't have somebody to help them we will deliver the service to their house using our own data the second way we can improve this is to change the law we were the first state it took us one year of waiting for all the vetting by the governor by the home ministry by the president finally after the new president has come we have got signed into law a bill we passed 12 or 13 months ago which says that the british era law that if a document is registered stating somebody as the owner it cannot be reversed by the government even if it's prima facie fake or false or fraud it has to go to court you know what happens if it goes to court so we changed the law we said if it is prima facie fraud if somebody has registered temple land in somebody else's name or government land or clearly some other owners then the registration inspector general has the right to cancel that subject to every single time there is such a cancellation there must be a criminal prosecution of a government employee who made that registration so we have a check and a balance this law we drafted and put into uh, the legislative assembly within few months of coming to office has taken us 13 months to get it approved by the union so we can change the laws to improve the incentive alignment or to uh, change the practice to do this the government of tamil nadu we have taken a complete top to bottom review i have announced my budget that we will set up a committee to look from hiring to training to placement to discipline to vigilance and anti corruption to the lok ayukta act to the right to information all of which falls under the hr ministry and we are about to announce the composition of that committee right now in total what i'd like to say is that if we do all of these things we can return to the politics of hope and prospects as opposed to the politics of threats and fear mongering and zero sum othering that we see today engendering hope is a much harder task than stoking fears but a government or a representative that consistently delivers that does a public mark to market can help build credibility build faith in the system it is hard but it is doable i just want to end on a personal note i came back from many years overseas to enter politics i couldn't even speak tamil i went on the campaign trail i never opened my mouth my father and grandfather and great grand uncle had left such a long set of coat tails that without paying money stated that i will not pay money i won the election by about 5000 something votes by about 3 and a half percent squeaking through but without paying i won compared to the state average i won by about 5% i was an opposition mla for 5 years i put in call centers i wrote 6 month reports about my progress i brought transparency to how i spent the constituency money i set up databases i set up complaint boxes i tried to bring every concept of administration and technology and systems optimization that i had learned in my career and apply it in madurai i did that for 5 years and the elections came again and many of my colleagues told me last time was a miracle can't repeat you better pay this time and i said no i won't pay so you lose i said well you win some you lose some this time i didn't pay this time i could speak tamil and this time i said don't vote for me based on my father based on my grandfather if i did good work for 5 years you vote for me if not you vote for another man who will do better work for me because my opponent was a man and this time i won by over 34000 votes and a margin of 15% compared to the state average of 8% so what i want to say is actually i'll say two things one i'll close by quoting pandit nehru again the genius who crafted this This is how he closes his trust with destiny speech. He says we have hard work ahead. 
there is no resting for any one of us till we redeem our pledge in full, till we make all the people of India what destiny intended them to be. We are citizens of a great country on the verge of bold advance, and we have to live up to that high standard. All of us, to whatever religion we may belong, are equally the children of India, with equal rights, privileges, and obligations. We cannot encourage communalism or narrow-mindedness, for no nation can be great whose people are narrow in thought or in action. To the nations and peoples of the world, we send greetings and pledge ourselves to cooperate with them in furthering peace, freedom, and democracy. And to India, our much-loved motherland, the ancient, the eternal, and the ever new, we pay our reverent homage and we bind ourselves afresh to our service. This is so important. What distinguishes a leader is not how many times you win elections. In my maiden speech in the Tamil Nadu Assembly, I happened to be at the receiving end of a whole bunch of kind of hagiographic platitudes from the ADMK members, because after 34 years of DMK, ADMK, DMK, ADMK, 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 the ADMK had come back with two successive victories. And they kept saying this every day, 10 times, 20 times. And so when I had a chance to make my maiden speech, I addressed uh, Madam Jailatha, the Chief Minister, and I said, 10 times a day, 20 times a day, we hear that you have won after 20, 34 years a consecutive victory. And I said, of course it's true. And if it's true, it doesn't need repeating 20 times a day. The fact that this goes into the record of the assembly, which nobody may ever read again, doesn't actually add anything to your mark on history. What you really need, if you are going to be a truly great leader, you don't worry about what the acolytes say every day in your presence. You don't worry about what the assembly record says. You worry about how posterity will view you. What will be the legacy that you leave behind? This is in my maiden speech. And to her credit, she engineered it in such a way that she actually gave me the freedom to talk. And uh, she took my speech right after and gave it some um, proper respect in some other ways. Why I say that is, I think all leaders need to remember, there used to be a time when history was written by the winners, but not anymore. These days we have ubiquitous tools to record events. We have infinite public memory, it's called the internet. We have zero cost transmission across all kinds of media. And we have permanent storage, drives that will last 200, 300 years. Winners do not write history anymore. In fact, the greatest, kindest, most erudite, most humble patriot that I have ever met in my life, Dr. Manmohan Singh said it best. After losing the election, he said, history will be kinder to me than the press. How true that has proven. The truth was always eternally invincible. Now history too is going to be unforgiving. Nobody should forget that. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you again for this opportunity. I look forward to the conversation with Anuradha and questions from others. And uh, I hope you found some of it interesting. Thank you.